But I guess when Bruce Lee is your dad, he's your dad. We weren't the sort of kids that went around saying, well, my dad's Bruce Lee and he could, you know, beat up your dad. <laughs> Even though I'm sure that's true for the most part. <laughs> Despite what his children thought, Bruce was not invincible. One morning in 1970, while working out with weights, he injured a major nerve in his back, which left him unable to train for six months. Frustrated, he poured his energy into refining his philosophy of Jeet Kune Do and began writing extensively on every aspect of martial arts combat. Doctors came to Bruce with devastating news. They told him that he would never be able to perform martial arts again. Vowing to prove them wrong, Lee, once healthy enough to train, set up an exhaustive daily fitness regimen. What he did, again, uh, turning a stumbling block into a stepping stone, he wanted to see just what the limitations uh, and capabilities of the human body were. He would do 2,000 punches a day, you know, 1,000 kicks a day. He would uh, run three miles and get on a bike and bike 15 miles. All of it was pushing to see what the human body was truly capable of. Still teaching martial arts, Bruce felt Hollywood had turned its back on him as an actor. Looking for work, he traveled to Hong Kong to promote himself and meet with Asian filmmakers. Run Run Shaw was the biggest Asian filmmaker. Unfortunately, the bid was a, a standard offer that he offered his contract players, which was like $200 a week uh, for about seven years. Well, that wasn't what Bruce was looking for, so he politely declined. Back in Hollywood in 1971, Bruce collaborated with Sterling Siliphant on a script for TV's popular Long Street series. Guest appearing as a martial arts master, Bruce was in fact so well received by the show's producers that he was offered a recurring role. But by now, Lee's status in Asia had changed. On a trip back to Hong Kong, he was astonished to discover that the Green Hornet had become hugely popular. Asian fans now referred to it as the Cato Show. And when he arrived there, thousands of people had come to the airport. He couldn't walk down the street without being mobbed the way that uh, Tom Cruise, I guess, today might be mobbed if he walked out on the street. As a result of his newfound fame, Bruce was asked to star in a film for top Asian producer Raymond Chow. Bruce expressed that he would like very much to come back to Hong Kong to make pictures. And I called him on the phone, and we started a conversation. The whole thing clicks. Then uh, we signed a three-picture deal, and he came back and the rest is history. Bruce's first assignment for Raymond Chow was as the star of a modestly budgeted martial arts film entitled The Big Boss. Introducing Bruce Lee. Every limb of his body is a lethal weapon against men. With savage beasts. Hong Kong moviegoers are renowned for being very vocal. <coughs> and they have even been known to like cut the seats with a knife or something if they didn't like the movie. So, we're sitting there. The crowd is hushed. And he thinks, for a second he thinks, oh my God, they hate it. The audience, I said, was sort of dumbfound at the end of the thing. Until everybody broke out into thunderous uh, applause. The Big Boss broke all previous box office records in Asia, and Bruce Lee was on his way to becoming an international star. But instead of taking his newfound celebrity status for granted, he pushed himself even harder. In his next film for Raymond Chow, Fist of Fury, Lee introduced the Nunchaku, a weapon never before seen in a martial arts film. Once again, the film broke all box office records. But success has many rivals, and one of them was film producer Run Run Shaw. Hoping to steal Bruce away from Raymond Chow, he tempted the actor with a blank check for his services. Instead, Bruce remained loyal to Raymond Chow. He proposed an equal partnership for a series of films. It was an offer Chow couldn't and didn't refuse. Professionally confident and financially secure, Bruce Lee had conquered Asia. But his real goal had eluded him. Bruce Lee wanted to take on the world. 
More on the life of Bruce Lee when biography continues on A&E. A&E's look at Bruce Lee continues on biography. In Hollywood, old habits die hard. And despite international fame as a martial arts superstar, Bruce Lee seemed no match for domestic prejudices. It was very difficult to convince people who could give a green light to a project that uh, an Asian hero would, would work as a marquee draw. They think that business-wise, it's a risk. And I don't blame them. In the same way it's like in Hong Kong, if a foreigner come and became a star, if I were the man with the money, I probably would have my own worry of whether or not the acceptance would be there. But that's all right, because if you, if you honestly express yourself, it doesn't matter. Bruce Lee, before he left for Hong Kong, was working with Warner Brothers, with Fred Weintraub, in developing a concept for a television show set in the Old West, and it was going to be called The Warrior at that point. It was later changed to Kung Fu. Uh, they never apparently considered him at all for the lead because, in their words, he was too Chinese-looking. And what happened was they ended up giving the role to a Caucasian actor, David Carradine, who they tried to make up to look half Chinese. Bitter at what he considered Hollywood's racism, Bruce now turned all of his attentions to his partnership with Raymond Chow. Having developed a keen interest in filmmaking while starring in The Green Hornet, Lee now oversaw all aspects of his new film, Way of the Dragon. It's Lee on the list. <laughs> He wrote it, he choreographed it, he starred in it, he played percussion and the music for the film. He had about eight hats on, you know, and it was his first ever directorial debut. Lee, on Marshall. Bruce was given the creative control he desired and made sure that his performance and the film would live up to his audience's growing expectations. One of the film's highlights was this grueling fight scene between Lee and his former student, Chuck Norris. At the beginning of that fight scene, Bruce Lee's character is losing because he's in a very rigid martial arts way. Chuck Norris's character is also rigid and he's a more powerful, bigger individual. Bruce at that point changes tactics and starts bouncing around like Muhammad Ali or Sugar Ray Robinson and uh, being non-telegraphic. As a result, Bruce Lee emerges victorious. Bruce stressed the need to show the ability to adapt instantly to whatever the situation was in front of you. Way of the Dragon smashed all previous box office records, and within weeks of its release, Bruce was busy prepping fight scenes for his next film, Game of Death. Co-starring would be his friend and former pupil, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I was flabbergasted, you know, like, this is something that we had dreamed about, but, you know, we've never really gotten a green light from anybody. It was a great experience. But before Game of Death was completed, Bruce finally got the call from Hollywood he had waited for all his life. He was offered his first starring role in an American film, Enter the Dragon. It would be a big-budget martial arts blockbuster and a validation of Bruce's years of dedication to his art. Now, more than ever, Bruce Lee was considered the number one martial arts practitioner in the world, on and off the set. Some kid was sitting on a, on a wall questioning his, whether he was just an actor, or could he really do any of the things that uh, he had been doing. And Bruce walked close to him, and then it was just snap, and he hit him. And, and the kid had a bloody nose and, and raised his hands, and that was it. To their eyes, uh, he was like Billy the Kid. People would, would try and take pokes at him when he was walking down the street. But Bruce would just, you know, use all the savvy that he'd developed and just play with these guys and, in fact, would make a move on them and then correct their form. Though Bruce was physically fit and at the top of his game, something was seriously wrong. He was training for something that would never come, a fight that would never happen. Bruce seemed to be on a seven-day-a-week schedule. He was just working hard, and he knew it, but with the success of Enter the Dragon, he would have achieved that place where he could pick and choose a little bit, take his time to find the right properties and develop them. So he was on the cusp of realizing his dreams. On May 10th, 1973, while editing Enter the Dragon in a Hong Kong studio, Bruce Lee became dizzy and collapsed. Rushed to the hospital, the actor appeared very close to death, 
although doctors couldn't determine the cause. Undergoing a battery of tests, he recovered sufficiently to return to work, and after completing Enter the Dragon, resumed work on the unfinished game of death. He was working with a Chinese actress who he thought might uh, be involved in the film as well. So he was at her house and um, he complained that he had a headache and she gave him a prescription tablet that she had called Equagesic and he went into another room and lay down. But when she couldn't wake him a few hours later, actress Betty Ting Pei called Raymond Chow. The phone rang and they said, I don't know what happens, but I couldn't wake up Bruce. So why don't you come? So in a hurry, I went to Betty's place, and uh, Bruce looked very pale. Raymond Chow called me and told me I should go to the hospital. And so I took a taxi to the hospital, and I just remember that I couldn't ask if he had died. And I said, is he alive? And they said, no. On July 20th, 1973, at the age of 32, Bruce Lee, martial arts master, was dead. We were shocked. Uh, I, I definitely was shocked. Um, my mom was, of course, you know, she was torn apart really bad. Because she, I mean, she was so proud of Bruce. And here was a man in the peak of health. And 